Hey, what up guys? Here's a new project coming at you and this one's called Op Art. Any clue on what Op and Op Art might stand for? Any ideas? It's not operation. It's not outpatient. Any other guesses? It actually stands for optical illusion art. When something plays tricks on your eyes, it's called an optical illusion. Op art is simply artwork that plays tricks on your eyes. Op art is simply a form of abstract art that gives the illusion of movement by the precise use of patterns and color. It might give the viewer a feeling of something that is moving, swelling, warping, or even flashing. Here's some examples in which you can look at to see how optical illusions or op art might have an effect on you. Can you see how this one looks like it's, it's moving? If your eyes are looking in one corner, it looks like the other corner might be twisting. Or how about this one? This one looks like it's like flashing at you. Well, let's bring it down a little bit and take a look at this one where it looks like some areas are beveled out at you, really enhancing the element of art form and giving the illusion that something is beveling out at you. Here's some artists that are famous for op art. This artist, her name is Bridget Riley. Here are some examples of her work. Or how about Victor Vassarelli? Here's some examples of his work as well. One of my favorite optical illusion artists is M.C. Escher. No relation. And he had a lot of artwork that played with people's minds. As you look at it, you think something might be happening, but really, something else might be going on. Guys, with our optical illusion, what we're going to be doing is we are going to be focusing on repetition. We're going to be repeating the same kind of lines over and over and over again. And then we're going to color it. And with our coloring, we're really going to enhance the form and really make it bevel out and give the illusion that some things are swelling out at the viewer and other things are going away from the viewer. So guys, pay attention, follow along. There's a lot of do's and don'ts. Pay close attention to the do's and the don'ts because that's what's really gonna make a difference in your piece. So here we go. All right, when starting on your optical illusion, on your op art, how to start this? You need to have your paper in landscape mode, which is side to side. And then you need to start off by drawing a line. My recommendation is to have a line with a little bit of wave. You could have a straight line or a line with a little wave. But what you don't want is you don't want to have a line has a crazy wave like this guy if you have a line with a crazy wave what's going to happen is it's going to get really confusing as you move along with your optical illusion once you're done with your line then what you're going to want to do is add a dot right in the middle you don't want a giant dot just a dot that 
places emphasis on where you want something. Once you're done with that dot, then what you're gonna do is you're gonna place three dots on this side and three dots on this side. You're gonna want these dots to be somewhat equally separated. You can have a little bit of diversity in separation from one area to the other, but you don't want anything that is too extreme. Something that would be too extreme would be like this example, where I've got my dots all bunched up here, but then have some huge gaps in other areas. The next step after this is to do some sausage links. That's what I like to call them. What you're gonna do is you're gonna start off on the edge of the paper. And right from the edge of the paper, you are going to connect from that area to the first dot. And then you're gonna go from that dot to this dot. and continue that from dot to dot. All the way to the edge of the paper. Now what I need to do is finish my sausage links by doing the bottom. Now, I'm not gonna lie, for me it's a lot easier to do it from the top rather than from the bottom. So there's a little trick, you can either work from the bottom, or you can simply flip your paper around and go from dot to dot again from the top. Now the next step is to pick one of these sections and then to build half circles on top of half circles. Once I start one, you need to finish it. You're not going to want to continue by getting half one done and then moving on to the following neighbors. Once you start one, you finish it. So it looks something like this. When I'm drawing my half circles on top of half circles, something that I'm paying close attention to is making sure that I am closing my half circles by touching the, the half circle that's below it. So touching the side, coming up, and then going down. Which brings me to my next rule. Whenever you go up, you have to also come down. If you're working on a bottom section, the rule is whenever you go down, in order to finish that half circle, you have to also come back up. Back to my first rule, once I start one, I need to finish it. At the very top, I continue to draw as though it's going off of the page. So therefore it looks like it's cropped off. A mistake that some students make is when they start off with a half circle, they continue to work down to the dot. You don't wanna do this because what happens is that this starts interfering with its neighbors. And I only said half circle on top of half circle. This is not a half circle. We are now starting to get to like a full circle. And this is what happens when you continuously go back down to the dot. You're gonna find yourself in trouble if you start doing this and it's gonna get really, really confusing. So again, half circle on top of half circle. Now that I'm done with one, now it's time to move on to its neighbor. A few rules when working with the neighbor. Same rules apply. Once I start, I finish it. If I go up, 
I also need to come down. Now when working with a neighbor, I also need to make sure that when I close my half circle, that it's closing in the connecting point of the circle that's below it and also within the neighbor. So right in here is where my next half circle will be closing. This gives the illusion that the two areas are colliding into each other. A mistake that people make, one, is when working with a neighbor. A lot of times people will go up, but they won't come down. And that is not giving us the illusion that we want. Again, the rule is when you go up, you must come down. The other mistake that people make is when working with a neighbor. You never want to trespass the neighbor. You don't want to go in on them. This completely ruins the effect of the illusion. Never, never trespass your neighbor. You just want to buddy up to them. Just like this. All right, moving on to the next neighbor. Anybody catch the mistake that I just made? You're right. Once I start one, I gotta finish it. Here we go. Another mistake that people make is if by chance you forget the rule of when starting you have to finish one. What happens is people have two that are partially finished and they get lost and they forget what to do. And what ends up happening is they end up starting a new one and they start it right in the middle of two of them. Again, this is gonna get really, really confusing. For one, the half circles always start on the dots. And for two, if you start one, you finish it. And for three, when you go up, you always have to go down and you have to finish next to the neighbor and on top of the half circle that you just created. If you follow those rules, you will never find yourself in this pickle. Now I'm done with these two, I can move on to this neighbor or this neighbor. Doesn't matter whichever one you prefer. Something that I wanna start showing you is that you have a lot of control with how these move within your piece. What I mean by this is that if I start here, I can make these get bigger by really bringing the connecting point of my half circle down on the sides. This will force my half circles to slowly get bigger. I can also make it get smaller by not bringing the sides of my half circle so low. I've got to keep it up on top. And then it's going to get smaller. The other thing that I can do is I can get this to turn right or get it to turn left by building on the side of my circles. Now what I'm gonna do for you is I'm gonna finish this whole top section for you. When dealing with the sides, you have two areas that you have to touch to close your half circles. You have your neighbor, and then you also have the edge of the paper. Some of you might be thinking, whoa, 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 Mr. Ash, what's going on with this guy? This guy, I have him end here. He's following all the rules. He disappears, so what I'm forcing this neighbor to do 
this neighbor then has to touch the edge of the paper, has to touch this neighbor, and then once it gets here, what's it gonna have to do? It's gonna have to touch this neighbor. Take a look. Now you need to be very, very careful. Some of you might be thinking, wait, Mr. Ash, you said when you start, you have to finish. And by finishing, you might have meant going up all the way up to the top of the, of the paper. I'm totally okay if you wanna to try to do this. The only problem with this is that a lot of times when students do it, the paper will start looking like this, and then when you get to the ends, you've gotta make your circle go from the end of the paper to the neighbor, and sometimes this can get really, really big, and it can look kinda of weird. So if you're going to attempt this, you gotta be really careful with it. Now that I'm done with my top half, now it's time to do the bottom half again. Me, I find it a lot easier um, when doing the bottom half upside down, which means that again, I'm doing the exact same thing that I did last time. I'm working upwards, which just makes it easier for me. So the other half, ready? Okay, now that I've got my other half finished, now it's time to really make it pop. And I'm gonna make this pop by tracing over my lines with ultra fine Sharpie. Now a few things to think about when tracing your lines with Sharpie is one, when you start a line, you need to finish it. What happens is students will do half and then when they go to do the other half, they have a hard time lining it up and then you get something that looks like this. Or they stop this way and then they go this way and they, and they have a very hard time getting it to line up. Again, when you start, you're going to want to finish it. Also a Sharpie, if you start it and then you stop and if you wait a quick second and then continue, it ends up bleeding and making a dot. Kind of ruins the craftsmanship of the piece. The other thing is, is that you're going to want to try your hardest to stay right on that line. Again, at the end, you can always erase the lines that are still showing by taking an eraser and just lightly going over. So therefore your pencil lines are not so prevalent. All right, now to trace all my lines, including that first middle line that we created. Lines traced. All right, now that I have it done with permanent marker, you can see how much my lines stand out. Visually very effective. Now that I'm done with permanent marker, it's time to start coloring. With coloring, my recommendation is to only pick two to three colors and keep it a pattern throughout your entire project. I'm choosing these three colors right here. I've got a dark blue, a green, and a light blue. Now with coloring, a few things to think about. We want neat coloring, and we want our coloring to support and enhance our project, not visually take away and steal attention. So with coloring, I have four rules for you to follow. One is to stay inside the lines. That's a rule that you've been learning since kindergarten. Stay inside the lines. The second rule is color in the same direction. And what I mean by this is that once you start in a direction, 
you continue in that same direction. If you change direction in the middle of coloring, this is what we call scribbling. To keep it from looking like scribbling, all you gotta do is color in the same direction. The other part, even though you might be coloring in the same direction, you might not be fulfilling the space. So you really want the pencil stroke to be nice and close, so therefore you are coloring in the entire area and not leaving white space in between your pencil stroke. And then the fourth and final rule is with this project, you have to do gradual value change. GVC is what I like to call it. Gradual value change is when you start with one value and as you work away from that value, you get to the opposite value. And what I mean by value is dark to light. Dark is one value, light is the other value. And it's gradually changing from one to the other. This helps the illusion of form being placed into your optical illusion. You don't want to do value change, which value change is when you go dark and then straight to light. And then you can see this line right there. That line, if you can see a line that indicates that you're doing it wrong, we want gradual value change through the entire thing. To give you an example of what this looks like, here what I'm going to do is I'm going to start dark in the bottom corners of each half circle. And as I work towards the middle, I'm gonna slowly get lighter and lighter and lighter. And then on the opposite side, again, I'm gonna start off dark, and as I work towards the middle of my half circle, I'm slowly getting lighter and lighter and lighter. And this gives the illusion that light is reflecting off of this area, which tells the viewer that this is beveled out. Again, what you don't want is you don't want to start dark and just create an instant value change. You do not want an instant value change. You want a gradual value change. There's a big difference from this to this. So again, the four rules to coloring. One, color inside the lines. Two, color in the same direction. Three, color in the entire space. And four, gradual value change. And this is what it looks like when it's fully completed. All right guys, there we go. Colored, finished. And this is what the end product should look like as long as you follow all of the directions and what you're supposed to be doing. Guys, that's the optical illusion project that we're gonna be focused on for the next few weeks. Really work hard, focus on that craftsmanship, do your best, and I can't wait to see your final work. Guys, have fun with this.